my entire family, um, those around us, friends, family that have been around us, it's been a massive support to have the letters of condolences, the messages, the SMSs, people visiting and that sort of thing. And it's sort of, it's uh, incredibly warming and touching um, that uh, ought to know that Dad had so many people that, um, um, that were so close to him and that uh, he meant so much to. I think if you look around the room, for starters, you'll see just how popular Jimmy was. Well, Jimmy and I met uh, probably about 20 years ago uh, when he was still down in uh, KwaZulu-Natal. And in fact, we met in extraordinary circumstances because in my, one of my television debuts, I was due to travel down from University in Maritzburg uh, to Durban. Uh, to present on the course and unfortunately I had a heavy night uh, the night before and uh, someone had to do the, the work for me and Jimmy uh, presented for me that day and that's how we got to meet because I was ever thankful for him filling, me, filling in for me that day. We always spoke candidly about everything. Um, there was, you know, it, it was always sincere, always light-hearted and we got along like a house on fire. So as terribly saddening as Jimmy's passing is this whole event, um, as wanted by the family and by Jimmy too, would be not a macabre event. It would be somewhere where everyone would come together and celebrate a jovial life that was uh, just full of life. When I heard that he had passed away, it was a, it was a big shock because you, you know you don't expect friends of 30 odd years to suddenly disappear on you. Not certainly not so suddenly, and I phoned Aiden to commiserate straight away. Later on in the day, I spoke to Dave Ferraris in Hong Kong, just by chance, and I also spoke to Barry Irwin in Kentucky. And here, on two sides of the world, came back the same things. Nature's gentleman, a constant person, passionate for the sport, always the same, loved the game. Both sides of the world, different recognitions, same thing character traits which last and last. Do you know that I had a girlfriend call me from America to say, am I in Cape Town? She's flying from America to attend Jimmy's memorial. Uh, he touched people far and wide, far than we ever imagined possible. A lot of his theater life, you know, Jimmy was a um, man for all seasons, really. You know, he was, he was the largest life and lived a very big life. Barry Irwin said he was the old school the sort of guy that you just don't get in racing anymore. And maybe that's a pity in racing because racing's not what it used to be. And maybe for each of us who are here now, it's a good time to reflect that it's up to us to make racing what it used to be, to bring back the type of racing that Jimmy Lithgow started with, what he loved. Uh, I remember somebody criticizing Jimmy to me one day saying, he's in charge of marketing and we only get 10,000 people to the track. His task is to get 15,000 people to every race meeting. And boy, has that changed too. You know, one, gets, one has regrets. You know, we kept on promising to get together. And uh, yeah, we, I've got fond memories that go back to Jimmy when I was 20 years old. You know, that's nearly 40 years ago. Um, so you know somebody for a long time. He was an old school gentleman, a wonderful character, honest as the day is long, passionate about everything in life, loved his family, loved racing. Um, was disappointed that his uh, presence or his gentlemanly attitude was not really appreciated uh, in the modern idiom of television uh, because he had the most beautiful speaking voice and he was a very cultured human being. Yeah, he'll be sorely missed and I don't think we've made enough use out of his talents. But um, uh, he's left a legacy behind, something we'll appreciate for many years to come and uh, I consider him a good friend. The overriding kind of um, thing about Jimmy is that everybody loved him and um, you know I, I wrote about it and I spoke about it at his memorial and when I first met Jimmy or first came across Jimmy was when he criticized one of my articles and um, I was a bit put out I'll be honest um, but I rang Goes him up. with the territory <laughs> but um, we had a good chat about it and um, well in fact sorry before I rang him up I phoned up the sporting post and I said who's this Jimmy Lithgow guy and they said oh you know Everyone loves Jimmy, and to me that is probably the thing that will define Jimmy for me because that's, that's, everybody loves Jimmy. You know, he was amazing. People who only met him once, that's the overriding memory of him is what a fantastic, charming, genuine, sincere person he was. Um, 
and I mean I don't think anybody can really say any more than that you know he just he just was a wonderful wonderful human being who touched a lot of people with his enthusiasm and his passion um, his enormous knowledge um, and his great sense of humor I think you know if you think of Jimmy you think of Jimmy laughing or you think of Jimmy making you laugh um, and that's how I remember him anyway welcome to this 12th uh, Morning and welcome to. No, that was a. F excuse me. <laughs> well, this morning we're down in KwaZulu Natal at Summerfeld, to be precise. What? Stuffed it up again. On Vodacom Durban July Day with the. Well, oh, shit. Duncan's certainly hitting the high spots at the moment with a decent sized string and the support of a number of, uh, let's say, more influential. What can I call them? I can't say well healed. I'll just say a, a select band of, yeah. But uh, perhaps more importantly, getting to know that the ho some of the horses that let's we know. And you're talking very right. blunt. Just talk. Okay. 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 I'm doing a Derek Watts. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoyed meeting Jeff Woodruff and some of the inmates of. I don't think inmates is a very good word, is it? Yeah. And I hope you enjoyed meeting him and some of his stable stars and rising. Jim, a uh, legend, you know, I mean, I can remember often standing here talking to Jimmy and go back to the office and have a cup of coffee or tea and sit and just shoot the breeze for an hour. He's a great guy and, and so knowledgeable and likable guy, you know, I, I must say, I must just the thought that Jimmy's not here doesn't actually sort of fit very well. It, it's 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 a it's a sad time, I think, for all of us, and especially the family. And you know, 68 nowadays, that's that's not old at all. And uh, I think Jimmy still had so much to offer. And uh, I think he was teaching the younger brigade. That excludes you, by the way. But uh, you know, anyway, I'm Aiden's turning into a, I think, a really a really good. Uh, documentary maker and he does some he does some lovely stuff so you know it's just a pity he didn't have longer with Jimmy to obviously learn some more but uh, at least the the dynasty carries on his life involved good clean fun uh, he was always joking around and of course there were always theatrics to go with Jimmy he always was my point of reference in terms of the pronunciation of horses names uh, presentation um, he seemed to be the one that would always correct us and uh, he'd always tell us about history. Uh, he was a history book. Uh, he knew a lot about horse racing. Uh, he would uh, fill us in on breeding, uh, on the potential of horses. He always would want to pick the July winner well before anyone else. And uh, he thrived on that too and he was often pretty much on the mark. He was very proud of his boys. That project of theirs, uh, I showed it to Fanny and Eric Tenorini. I loaned them the disc, that, the test disc that Jimmy and Aidan gave me. And uh, they phoned me up and they said, please tell these people not to stop. It's a fabulous project and it should be kept for posterity. And that's what um, a man of Jimmy's talents would have done. You know, We should have put more money. That, that project should still get more money. And I hope Aidan finishes it in Jimmy's memory. I think that's where Elaine comes into it. And um, they had a very lovely tribute from one of the family members who said um, you know how fortunate Jimmy was to have Elaine and anybody I, again anybody who met Jimmy I think um, would have heard him say how grateful he was to have Elaine and, and you know how strong their relationship was because they were such wonderful um, I guess contrasts in many ways um, because for all the things that Jimmy couldn't do she could and she allowed him so much because of the, the fact that she is the practical person and you know gets on with the day-to-day -day and the admin and the you know the boring stuff that a lot of us would also like to <laughs> get somebody else to take care of for us and I think one of the joys of Jimmy and Elaine's relationship was they each gave each other the chance to shine in their own um, special way and um, and Elaine I think we'll always be grateful to Elaine for giving us so much of Jimmy and that was enormously generous of her. He would give me wonderful art books for my birthday and Rod McEwen LPs and poetry and things that were a little surprising when I opened them, but I always knew that, okay, I need to improve myself, I need to better myself and be what he, he sees. I never made it, 
but he never stopped believing in his little chablet baby sister with the frizzy hair who has never amounted to much in her life besides producing three wonderful sons. But he adored me and I adored him. And he came to visit me in Atlanta last year. And Graham and I, my husband and I, drove up to Kentucky to fetch him. And then we spent some wonderful days in Atlanta. And then he really wanted to meet my grandson in Florida. And we got in my car, listened to Showboat all the way down to Florida. <laughs> and he spoke about his beloved Elaine. He spent most of the time telling me about his wonderful sons and how, and I think this is extraordinary, not many people have this gift to be able to give their children the freedom to do what they want to do without any influence whatsoever. And he and Elaine did that. And he had so many passions that he almost, you just thought he, no, no one lifetime could fulfill all those passions. But Elaine, he said to me, was his rock. And she was always there for him when he was in hospital for about four weeks. She fashioned a backrest because he was having terrible backaches. And then one day she'd gone home, she'd made this cushion for his back with arm supports and brought it to the hospital the next day. And she gave him the freedom to pursue all those the, all the plays he was in and the, the dreams that, the, the, all the interests that he had and not many wives can do that. I as a wife, I think I could easily do it, but, <laughs> but Elaine was just always there for him and she was remarkable. Well, that's Abington Place, essentially a work in progress, but already boasting all the facilities required to make Mike de Kock one of the most competitive trainers here in the UK and, of course, at the Dubai Carnival. Well, that rather sadly brings us to the end of our 12-part Stable Talk series. We hope you've enjoyed this tramp through the stables of many of our leading South African trainers. My thanks to our crew and, of course, to the number of trainers who've participated along the way. From Stable Talk, cheerio. Davey, I think we've had many great escapades with the late Jimmy Lithgow, whether it was at Royal Ascot, whether it was at Kenilworth or Gravel or Turfentane or wherever it was. He was a thoroughly entertaining, genuine, kind, loving person. You've known him for 25 years. Yes, I have. He was actually your complete, if you put it into cricketing terms, it's your complete all-rounder, wasn't he? Because he started off with marketing and his other uh, jobs and he uh, progressed to the press and the media. He was eloquent and he was a lovely person to be with. I think people enjoyed being with him. That was uh, one of the, his main attributes. You know, the thing about him is, is he, he knew his horses, he knew horse racing, and he was, you know, he, he did the studio. The studio work was to put bread on the table. But when he got out into the field, he got out into the stables and, and the yearlings and all that sort of thing, that's where, that was his forte. That was when he really came alive. And then he did this uh, program, the stable, I don't know what it was called stable now, talk. stable talk. And he went to see people like uh, uh, Dennis Dreyer, and Jeff Woodruff. Now, they don't suffer fools gladly, these boys. And I tell you what, you could see they were listening to his questions. They were saying, hello, here's a guy that knows the sport and we're gonna listen and we're gonna give good answers. Uh, and that was his forte, in my opinion. Yeah, he did his research properly. I mean, he was not a kind of guy that stood up and, and tried to busk things. No, he wasn't. And he was such a kind man, you know. I mean, I, I've never heard anybody say, you know, some man said, oh, he's boring, he's boring. They only found him boring because he was eloquent, uh, which p people didn't really... Uh, doesn't go down so well these doesn't, days. Doesn't go down, correct. But, I mean, he's, he's been a wonderfully kind man. And the perfect example uh, was at Teletrack with Pine Pinar, who's been a loyal man at uh, Teletrack, but very ill in recent months months and apparently and I only found this out a fortnight ago is that Jimmy actually did some of his shifts and gave him the money gave him the money that he worked for absolutely outstanding that comes from the heart and it is directly as a result of the vision of Jimmy Lithgow that I was privileged enough to have anything to do with London News in fact it saw the start of my international career and I thank you London News for having taken me around the world Let's find out from Jimmy Lithgow exactly what gave rise to this decision. 
It was just after London News had won the JNV Met in 1997 that the Jaffees announced that they were going to mount a campaign to win the QE2 Cup in Hong Kong, which might have seemed a little bit far-fetched then because uh, no South African horse had uh, done anything abroad since the days of Hawaii, and Hawaii had been exported. I mean, this was a case of a horse being taken over with a specific task in mind. And uh, it was an exciting thought. Andrew Baum approached me. I was manager of Highfelt Racing Authority's uh, marketing division at that time and suggested that he and the cameraman go over to Hong Kong and cover this event. And we agreed to that. And thank goodness we did because we came away from it with fantastic footage that Andrew used to send back to South Africa for editing here and uh, we would produce these little documentaries to build up excitement about London News's assault on that big race in Hong Kong. And uh, it generated enormous interest and excitement. And as an experiment, it proved absolutely invaluable. And I only wish that we documented more uh, on some of the great horses in times past. We're currently at Turfentain Racecourse and I'm standing next to the Henneman Memorial which commemorates the loss of life, probably the biggest disaster that South African horse racing has ever experienced back on the 12th of April 1988. And I'm going to sit down here so that you can reflect on some of the lives that were lost on that particular day. Now many of you regular race goers will be all too familiar with many of the names behind me but we're not going to dwell on the Henneman Memorial tonight, but more so on a man that put together the most sensitive and beautiful productions on this tragic occurrence for South African horse racing. And I refer, of course, to the very one and the very only Jimmy Lithgow. You see, Jimmy Lithgow got married here at Turfentain Racecourse to Elaine Rathbone. And the centenary room is the place in which many of his friends and family came to pay their last respects to this unique human being. Many people had an opportunity to express their condolences and their reflections on this great man. And probably the most moving of the whole lot was his son, Aidan Lithgow. And tragically, somehow, only the good Lord above knows how this happened, that piece of footage is completely off the face of the earth. Disappeared, vamoose, no longer available. Never, ever been sighted again. But fortunately, we had the opportunity to go to Aidan's house and to find out how he is doing two weeks down the line reflecting on his business partner, his best friend, and his late father, Jimmy Lithgow. I was dreading uh, going to your dad's memorial, but when I left there, I felt so enriched, I felt so uplifted to hear that this dear man had so many people that loved him so much. And I know that it must have been very difficult for you on the particular day, but you know, your family around you and all these dear friends, um, time is a great healer. How's Aidan Lithgow doing right now? Uh, first of all, I know what you mean. I mean, I was dreading it as well, you know. Um, it's not easy, Andrew. Um, my dad and I had a very close relationship. We, we were best friends. We were soulmates. We worked together. We loved each other's company. We had a lot in common, not only the racing, but the theatre side and the film side. And so, you know, it's a, it's. I was shattered. I'm still shattered. I'm devastated. You know, it was it was. It came out of the blue on the Thursday afternoon. We were working together, prepping for our shoot that was actually supposed to start today. He was heavily involved in that. Um, you know, we were in each other's space 24/7, and and we were having a great time. You know, um, so it's not easy. You know, it's 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 one of those things. It, it's going to happen to everybody. It's when it's your time, it's your time. We try and take some comfort out of that. Thank God it happened quickly. Um, you know, he didn't suffer, but <laughs> unfortunately, it's always most difficult for those who are left behind. You know. Do you think the legends inspired him again? I'd like to think so. I mean, I saw him pick himself up, and he was incredibly passionate about it. He had um, gone through a little bit of a down phase. You know, he was getting to that point in, in one's life, I guess, where you're, you're battling a little bit to wonder what your worth is, how much you're worth anymore, and, you know, and I was just so, Dad, geez, you, you know, how can you even speak like that? Look at your track record. Look what you mean to people. Look how people just gravitate towards you, you know? How could you even be thinking like that? And, and then we started working on the Legends series, and we got full steam into that, and, yeah, I mean, he was, 
it was you know, I always like to think of my dad as, as Peter Pan it was quite funny because when we were when I was young we, we actually did the show together at uh, the, the pantomime together at NAPAC and he played Mr. Darling and I was one of the lost boys and that always defined my dad for me that he was the modern day Peter Pan in spirit he was young at heart he, his, he was just he just had that young spirit he was playful you know not much used to get him down when he was down he wouldn't let people know about it you know he'd always just pick other people's spirits up before before himself he just never put himself first and always about other people and what he could do for them and you know that's what made him such a great human being but I'd like to think that the legend series picked him up I cert it certainly did buoy his spirits he was he was so looking forward to to getting stuck in you know we was we used to, we used to have a lot of a lot of laughs you know we used to spend the whole day together writing and he called himself the casting director and I said oh dad you're giving yourself a title there you know he says well why not you know it's what I'm doing so he was casting the horses and he was running around Ryan Key's going to train his yards and looking at horses so definitely you know he loved to be involved in my life as well and what was important to me was important to him and obviously the legend series is something that we've been working on for a long time on and off stop start we now in the home straight and you know just he was he was so fired up because he 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 has that passion for for racing for the thoroughbred um for just champion stories you know he loved that that's what got him involved as a kid um, and and he saw the merit in it you know he he was he was just I think he was obviously very proud and he, he wanted to see that come to fruition and you know I believe that he will um, he'll be the legend lives on yeah exactly the legend does live on yeah I'm standing on the Top Star Mine Dump, literally a stone's throw from the center of Johannesburg. And from this vantage point, you get a pretty fair idea of just how close Turfentine Racecourse, which you see in the background, is to the city center. It wasn't always like that. Of course, Johannesburg was founded on gold. And here on the high felt, horse racing has been very much driven by the gold mining industry over the years. Way back in 1886, when those first diggers arrived here on this barren open felt to stake their claims, they were looking for some form of entertainment, and horse racing was just perfect. Legend has it that the first horse races actually finished round about where Elof and Commissioner Streets bisect today. But the historians have actually found out that the race course was laid out more or less along the course of Twist Street, which is some way towards the east. In 1899, the stewards of the Johannesburg Turf Club concluded protracted negotiations with Paul Andries Russ for the purchase of land just south of the town, obtaining a 100-year leasehold at a rental of £300 per annum. And so the Johannesburg Turf Club moved onto the farm Turfentain, building a handsome new grandstand and other spectator facilities. There's quite a romantic little story concerning the runnings of the Summer Handicap, or the Summer Cup as it's now known, in 1954 and then again in 1955. And the romance, in fact, concerns me. As a child, I used to play on this mine dump. Uh, it wasn't grassed as it is now. It was just your normal gold-colored uh, mine sand. 
back in the distance where those tiled roofs are was more or less where my grandparents had a home on Robinson Deep Mine, my grandfather having been the compound manager there at the time. And you can see the Turfentine Racecourse was uh, not very far away, and my grandmother was something of a victim in those days and used to go racing frequently. Well, she came home one day and uh, told me about an extraordinary horse which really fired up my imagination. The horse was called Nagaina Hall. He was the champion three-year-old of that particular year, was winning just about every race that uh, he was entered for. Her version of events was that, in fact, he was winning because his owner, a certain Mrs. Cohen, used to feed him sugar lumps when he got into the number one box. Well, I thought this was great and uh, started following the Gainer Hall. He won the Summer Handicap that year in 1954 with the late, great Tiger Wright in the saddle. He became my hero, and the next year I was mortified when he was beaten by a little upstart grey pony called Casbah. Kesbar was trained by a man called Les Rathbone. Little did I know then that Les Rathbone was going to become my father-in-law about 19 years later. It was, I think, the afternoon in about 1972 at Turfentine Racecourse. My parents had been invited to lunch with Sandy Christie and his wife in those days, and the Rathbones were at the same table. They invited my parents to come round on the Sunday morning for tea and a look round the stables, and my folks suggested that I go too. Well, we arrived at the stables, and who should come out to greet us? The lady who was to become my future wife. I'm very proud of the fact that uh, Elaine, in fact, trained a horse during her racing career that ran in the summer handicap. And uh, now the end is near And so I face the final curtain my friend, I'll say it clear, I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full, I traveled each and every highway, and more, much more than this. I did it my way Regrets, I've had a few But then again, too few to mention I did what I had to do Saw it through Without exemption I planned Each charted course Each careful step Along the byway Much more than this I did it my way Yes, there were times I'm sure you knew when I bit off more than I could chew But through it all when there was doubt I ate it up and spit it out I faced it all and I stood tall and did it my way I've loved I've laughed and cried I've had my fill My share of losing And now As tears subside I find it all So amusing did all that and may I say not in a shy way oh no oh no not me I did it my way for what 
What is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not to say the things he truly feels and are the words of one who kneels. The record shows. 